Asia-Pacific Centre for Data Enterprise Open Lecture. And we've had a, a flurry of open lectures this, this month. I'm glad to see that there's a few uh, return attendees. Um, my name's Jeremy Williams, and I'm the director of the, the centre. And uh, as is customary, I'd like to first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Turbo Yugera people on which we are meeting. I would also like to pay my respect to elders past and present and to extend that respect to other <coughs> Indigenous Australians who are here this evening. Tonight, I have great pleasure in introducing you to uh, Dr. Robert Boutillier, who is a visitor to Australia. He's here um, courtesy of the Australian Centre for Corporate Social Responsibility, and I'd, I'd also like to take this opportunity of welcoming uh, Dr. Leora Black, who is sitting there with the purple cardigan on, who is the uh, director of that centre. And uh, she and I have uh, uh, agreed to collaborate in some small way, and that's um, one of the reasons why Robert is, is joining us here tonight. He's, he's talking at some other university down the road, I can't remember the name now, um, University of Queensland. Uh, he's got a seminar there coming up over two days. Um, some of you may be going along to that. Um, a little bit about Robert. He's uh, um, an associate of the Centre for Sustainable Community Development at uh, Simon Fraser in Canada and uh, also the aforementioned Australian Centre for Corporate Social Responsibility. He has conducted stakeholder mapping research and workshops on stakeholder relations for managers around the world and specialises in resource development and infrastructure projects. And uh, she's been talking to him about this. There's some very interesting things to share with us tonight. And uh, he was talking to me about his, his most recently published book, um, entitled The Stakeholder Approach to Issues Management. And I also managed to get some information from him on his upcoming book as well. So um, he may, may talk about that in passing tonight, if there is opportunity. But uh, the, uh, the most recent book presents a system for integrating measures of the social license to operate um, with data on network structures and issues analyses. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to ask Robert to come up and uh, take the stage. And please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, social license, social change, and social contract. I really only know about the social license and the other part. I thought I'd just have a little fun and go off on a tangent tonight and uh, talk about uh, ideas that, that uh, were suggested by some of the research we've done on the social license. So if any of you really know about the social contract, you might find this amusing. <laughs> but uh, um, the, uh, the idea of the social license has uh, become quite uh, uh, current. You can read about it in almost uh, any uh, major newspaper <laughs> uh, any week. Um, but uh, originally, um, a friend of mine coined that term, uh, Jim Cooney. He was uh, a, uh, a Vice President of External Affairs at Placer Dome, a, a Vancouver-based gold mining company. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's got a background in theology. And how he became a mining executive is uh, still a mystery to him <laughs> as well as everybody else. But uh, he was kind of uh, uh, trying to get the industry to start paying attention more to uh, the social side of uh, its impacts. And uh, at that time, the, there was a, that was the first round of protests against mining uh, 
and all of the major companies had some sort of uh, uh, controversy. And so he was uh, in, a, in, a, in an attempt to try to focus the industry's attention on these issues. Uh, he coined the term social license to operate and used that, uh, that metaphor at a meeting of the, uh, with the World Bank in early 1997, and then they started using it. And it developed from there within the mining industry in, in the early days. And Jim's idea was uh, to uh, do an analogy with the legal license in order to draw attention to the fact that projects were getting stopped uh, because of community objections. And so just as a companies needed to go to the government and get their approval. They also need to go to the communities and get their approval. Uh, Jim now is working on uh, the concept, he's retired and working on the concept of uh, uh, the uh, preferential option for the poor and open up a dialogue between the International Council of Mining and Metals and and the um, Vatican, because uh, many of the projects, uh, uh, much of the opposition to mining projects in Latin America and some other parts of the world comes from Jesuits. And now we got a Jesuit pope, so <laughs> they're going to, uh, he's trying to get a dialogue going with them. Looks like that's going to go ahead. But in any way, in the early days of um, the, uh, development of the, of the concept. It spread throughout the mining industry. Jacqueline Nelson did a, a master's thesis on that in, in 2006 and, and confirmed the, the meaning uh, to mining people. It's uh, the social license to operate is, is granted by the community. Uh, it has to be renewed daily, which means that it's a, a continuous process of uh, g maintaining uh, the approval. Uh, and acceptance of the community. And that's how it's, uh, the, it was originally defined as ongoing approval or acceptance. Uh, and then um, uh, Susan Joyce and uh, Ian Thompson uh, took the concept a little further and uh, speculated that there might be different levels of social license that a, a project could have. Uh, so they talked about um, uh, uh, accept, uh, acceptance being the next step above having your social license withdrawn. And then if there was even more uh, um, uh, positive relationships with the community, there would, they would grant approval. So they talked about levels. And that was on the basis of a lot of work they were doing with communities and, uh, and mining companies. Uh, then. Uh, Ian Thompson and I got together and specified uh, yet another level, uh, which, is, which I'll, I'll describe in a minute. Um, and we embedded the whole concept of the social license to operate in resource dependence theory. Um, that's an existing theory in management, which says that the, um, the, the, the question there is why do firms exist? Why, why, do, why do companies exist? And the, and the answer is, uh, uh, one of the things is they have to uh, gain access to resources in order to exist. So they depend on, in this case, stakeholders in order to uh, get access to the resources uh, needed to maintain their existence. And uh, so the social license operated an application of that idea and therefore also an application of the idea of risk management. In this case, it's socio-political risk management. So if you have a higher level of social license, you've, you've lowered your social political risk uh, and ensured more uh, access to the vital resources that the company needs. And uh, we also uh, embedded it in the idea of stakeholder network analysis, which I'll explain in a minute why that was uh, needed. And then Leora Black uh, wrote a book in uh, last year on uh, 
the social license to operate, and where she included measures, how you can measure the social license and the factor analysis of those measures of the social license. And since uh, in the last two or three years, um, the term has been used in uh, a lot of different uh, academic publications, the uh, Commonwealth Scientific and Research Organization, do I have that right? Or Research and Scientific, Scientific and Industrial Research Organization has published a book on the social license to irrigate so that's related to getting access to that vital resource of water and, uh, and legitimizing that access. So, uh, and it's been applied in infrastructure, energy, all sorts of industries uh, talk about it now and politicians talk about it and uh, journalists talk about it. So the meaning has gone wild, <laughs> spread, spread beyond uh, its, orig its origins in um, Mining. Uh, I think uh, we can maybe sharpen the, the understanding of it a little more by distinguishing it from related concepts. Um, it's unique from other concepts because it emphasizes that stakeholders have power over corporations. So if companies need a social license to operate, they are uh, dependent on uh, uh, the grantors of the social license uh, for their the operations. So that's a unique idea. It's not that, it's, it, not everybody accepts that. There's some resistance to that idea. Uh, the, uh, if you read um, the corporate reports, they'll say, you know, we got a social license because we did this and that, and they try to make it try to make investors believe that everything's under control, under their control, <laughs> when really it's not under their control. Uh, they need to, it's under the control of the stakeholders who grant that social license. And then there'll be others who resist the idea of uh, stakeholders having the power because they want to maintain the position of the stakeholders being uh, the underdog. So that's just a political objection to this, this kind of language. Um, but I think this is uh, probably the core of what makes it distinctive from other um, concepts. Corporate social responsibility is an idea that has a longer history and uh, is, more, is a broader, broad set of things you need to do in order to uh, make sure that uh, you can get a social license to operate. Uh, the list of things might be different in different places, but uh, the general concept of corporate social responsibility will cover um, pretty much everything you need to do in order to win a social license to operate. The, ter the term stakeholder engagement is one of the key processes in building uh, uh, a social license, uh, creating perceptions of legitimacy, credibility, and trust that, uh, that will raise the level of social license. Free prior inf and informed consent. Well, where the consent means a veto, uh, it's qu quite a similar idea to the social license to operate. Um, so it, 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 tends, it comes from a different discourse where the uh, uh, the stakeholders are more uh, vulnerable and therefore you have to pay close attention to the freedom and the informed because they're likely to be uh, not free and uh, not properly informed from that discourse, from that point of view. But really uh, it, it, it amounts to the same thing in practice uh, where, where consent means a veto. And uh, sustainability. Uh, is uh, more general in its application. Uh, it covers more things, uh, but it often overlaps because stake that's what stakeholders are concerned about. So um, the idea that the social license to operate can vary over time and needs to be renewed daily came from uh, Ian Thompson's early work uh, at Minera San Cristobal, and they've granted uh, permission to use this data from, from their mining operation. That's a, a lead-zinc uh, 
mine in uh, lead zinc silver mine in southwest Bolivia. Uh, and uh, this is um, a retrospective uh, assessment of how the social license changed uh, from the 1994, the discovery of the mineral deposit there by the geologist to the uh, eventual construction of the mine and operation of the mine. It, it went up quite rapidly uh, at the beginning. Uh, the town, the, well, the, the mineral deposit was underneath the town, uh, right underneath the town. <laughs> so they were sitting on a pot of silver. Uh, and they were thinking about moving anyway. Uh, some families had already split off and formed a couple of other villages closer to the main highway anyway, uh, um, a couple of, a decade earlier. And so the, when they t uh, the, um, the exploration company talked about moving the village, they were quite happy with that. Uh, the company uh, asked the, the villagers to take charge of designing the new village, uh, how, where, designing the whole thing, this layout of the streets, the design of the houses and all of that. And so they, they came to see it as a kind of partnership where we, you know, we've got the, the surface rights, you've got the subsoil sub rights, and we'll work together to make this our project. And the, the social license went up quite high uh, at that point in terms of how people talk about it retrospectively. And then they moved, and then, uh, you know, the houses weren't exactly what they expected. The women weren't involved in the design, and things weren't working out as well <laughs> as the uh, for the women who, uh, uh, you know, for their use of the, the house, and uh, then mineral prices declined and the project got put on hold, and the social license went right down to quite a low level by that point. The company started a few programs to get, uh, to, to repair its relationships, and then the mineral prices increased again, so everything's uh, go again. The social license rose. Then the, a new management team came in to, con to, for, to do the construction, to build the mine, the plant, and so forth. And they didn't know anything about all the uh, accords and promises and relationships that had been developed previously. They just brought in the bulldozers and started changing the landscape drastically. And, uh, they plowed through a community garden at one point, and uh, the social license was withdrawn. The construction was stopped by the community, um, which is you know, the ultimate definition of losing your social license. You don't get access to your resources. You can't operate. Um, that was patched up, and um, you know, uh, compensation made, uh, and they got the mine finally constructed, and everybody started getting jobs. <coughs> and uh, up to 2008, uh, the social license was was still rising, and people were now they had a flow of income, and uh, things were going better. That's when we started actually measuring the social license in a quantitative way. But anyway, the point was that there, um, it changes uh, over time, it changes with circumstances, uh, it has to be uh, maintained continually, and it has different levels. We uh, identified these levels, uh, uh, withheld acceptance, approval, or psychological identification when they just see it as our project. And uh, you see that in other uh, towns dominated by an industry as well, like Hollywood uh, identifies with the uh, movie industry, uh, San Francisco, uh, San Jose identifying with the uh, computer industry, Silicon Valley. So that's psychological identification. Um, when we uh, started uh, Doing uh, formal interviews with the stakeholders, we would first ask them, what are, the, what are your concerns? Um, 
and what are your priorities, and then we would uh, get them to rate uh, their agreement on a five-point scale with uh, 15 different uh, statements about their relationship with the company, and we focused on the relationship because the relationship will be affected by all the other factors, and that makes it transportable from one mind to another, from one time to another, uh, from one uh, from one culture or era to another. The relationships are relatively uh, universal aspect of uh, human, human relations. And so if they are affected by what's going on, by the amount of dust or uh, access to jobs or whatever is going on at the mine site, uh, then the, the changes in the, the ratings of the relationship uh, W the r ratings of the relationships will change uh, in response to those things. So it's kind of like the ultimate outcome measure, but it's one that you can apply anywhere. So that was kind of a breakthrough in terms of how do we measure this in a way that can be where we can make comparisons across minds and across time. So there's 15. But we started out with more than 15 statements, and then we did analyses to pick out the, uh, the statements that were uh, distinguishing the most, uh, had all the right characteristics in terms of measurement, and uh, we averaged those to produce a um, one score per stakeholder organization. We do the interviews with the uh, leaders of the stakeholder organizations rather than with individuals. It's not a public opinion survey. It's uh, a, a census of the leaders of the groups that are organized enough to be able to articulate a point of view and uh, have, a, have a, a voice in the, in the po local politics and the stakeholder network. Now we have over um, 1,800 interviews done with stakeholders and organization representatives uh, they've been conducted in 46 mining projects in 10 countries, nine languages, four continents. So it's been from Africa and uh, uh, Latin America, North America, Australia. And um, when we uh, uh, now we got now we have a sort of uh, an emerging database of scores, social license scores. So. We're, uh, we wanted to see what's normal uh, worldwide, so divided them into six equal groups, and, uh, and the mean came out around, on a five-point scale, the mean came out around 3.34, which is around uh, high acceptance. So these um, six equal groups uh, were, were labeled as uh, lowest one, you get, the social license is withheld. Uh, and then the next level is acceptance. It's either low acceptance or high acceptance. The next level above that is approval, low or high, and then full trust. So this is the kind of uh, a graph of the model that we've come up with uh, as it stands now, how the theory has uh, evolved from a metaphor to something you can measure and used to uh, manage a project. The, uh, on the right-hand side here uh, uh, are the levels of the social license, the four levels we came up with. Either you don't have it, or there's acceptance, approval, or psychological identification. The boundaries between these came from the words of stakeholders themselves. They would talk about, you know, um, in, in uh, Ian Thompson's original studies, you know, wh why did you block the road? Well, the company lost its legitimacy. We didn't see their actions as legitimate. Um, and then when there was a, a change from acceptance to approval, now we knew the company was credible because, you know, they did this or that. And so that was, seemed to be a, a turning point, uh, a criteria for moving from just plain acceptance where there's still questions, there's still doubts, uh, there's still suspicions to approval where, yeah, we're in favor of this. We actually say uh, we're, uh, we actually support it. And then full trust uh, being that level where it's our project too. Um, 
Now, we didn't know what credibility meant. Legitimacy was easy because there's a lot of uh, uh, management and sociology literature on, and philo philosophical literature on legitimacy and jurisprudence literature. Uh, there's a lot on sociology and management literature on trust. Ooh, credibility was uh, kind of mysterious to us until we did the factor analysis on the measures of the social license uh, that we had, and they came out with these four factors. Well, we could see legitimacy of benefits kind of lining up with this criteria. We could see institutionalized trust lining up with that. That's trust that's been going on for such a long time that it, it doesn't depend on the individuals anymore. The organizations are, are interlinked. They have their uh, mechanisms for resolving their differences with each other, and it's all institutionalized. But what was credibility? And so it seemed to be the um, combination of things, combination of social capital and social contract. So I'll describe each of those factors a little more so <coughs> we can see what, what it actually means to raise your level of social license. The, the legitimacy of benefits is the answer to the question, what's in it for us? If somebody comes and says, you know, we're going to build a big dig a big hole in the ground <laughs> next to your village. Uh, first thing you want to know is, well, is there anything in this for me or not? And it doesn't necessarily just have to be uh, a financial gain. It can be, you know, status considerations are important, although people don't talk about those directly. They tend to cloak them in some other issue, but they are important. And um, community family cohesion is another benefit that you might get the children won't have to leave the village in order to find a job. We'll be able to keep the family together because there'll be jobs, things like that. So benefit the, if there's benefits, uh, you're likely to um, move up that first criteria of legitimacy to have at least acceptance. Um, the concept of uh, social capital and social contract. Together, they seem to make up what uh, the, that credibility criterion in the original model. Social capital is built by working together and developing mutual expectations uh, and demonstrating reciprocity. So it's like good relationships and good communications. Uh, so when, when we hear stakeholders saying, you know, they never talk to us, uh, w w you know, or we, we, uh, we tell them what we want and then we don't hear from them, that's uh, a failure on the, the social capital uh, dimension. And so it's reducing the credibility of, of, the, uh, of the company. The social contract more uh, concerns perceptions of fairness and identity and, and I think therefore it connects the uh, social license to, to history and cultural differences because there are differences in cultural differences in uh, perceptions of what is fair. Um, it's also about the compatibility of the project with uh, current resource use patterns. Uh, there'll be conflicts over water use and land use. Uh, and uh, is it compatible, you know, this pro uh, proposal? Um, and uh, so the social contract, it could be, the social contract aspect of the social license could be part of a bottom-up development of a, a, um, a social contract for a broader unit, uh, a region or a country. And this is something that uh, the companies tend to have more trouble with. I mean, they can do social capital because it's a question of, of good communications, good relationships, but Social contract isn't so much under the control because uh, it involves longer term historical things and factors that are um, uh, outside their control. So uh, it, it, for example, one of the things that can involve is challenging uh, self-serving elites or, or aggressive rent seekers who uh, are not interested in coming to an agreement about the common good. Uh, they want to set up the social contract for their own benefit, and uh, that can uh, that can put the uh, company in some conflict. So.
so it's harder to deal with. So I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but uh, the institutionalized trust, the highest level of the social license is where there's systems in place to solve the inevitable problems. They've been proven and accepted and become routine. Um, in the sense that you know we're in this together. There's been a little bit of research on uh, this model of the social license. And uh, here, uh, by people here in Brisbane, <laughs> Moffat and uh, Aaron, 2004, just published, uh, 2014, published a paper on a, a study of coal seam gas projects uh, in Australia. And uh, they found that they, the, the factors they looked at and uh, that came out of their measures, uh, that they looked at were contact quality. Um, and uh, that seems similar to social capital. Procedural fairness is more like the social contract. Uh, so uh, and it bears a general similarity to this model turned on its side. Uh, so <laughs> you have to the social, uh, the infrastructure impacts would be like legitimacy of benefits. Then these two things are needed in before you can build trust and they found those positive relationships there with these things and the building of trust and finally the acceptance or approval which is what we call the social license so there's some uh, parallels in what they found and what we propose so that's good um, one of the problems that we run into with the problem of this with the concept of the social license license is <coughs> Who counts as social? Who gets to say that there is or isn't a social license? Uh, if one stakeholder uh, withdraws a social license, maybe that's not such uh, uh, a loss of the social, the social license for a project. Uh, farmers oppose fracking in Queensland, but the industry still has supporters and it's still legal. Uh, you know, is, can we say it's lost its social license or not? And some people say yes, and some people say no, and some people say, what does that mean anyway? <laughs> so uh, th th this is a bit of a problematic uh, aspect of the concept. Um, I think it's more accurate uh, to talk about reduced or enhanced social license. Uh, to, um, in, in terms of reduced or enhanced access to uh, resources that are vital to the operation. So not an all or none thing to remember that it's got levels and those levels are more or less continuous. So, and the other thing is to specify the size and influence of the network clusters that grant various levels of social license because there are differences of opinions among stakeholders. Um, better to acknowledge that they exist than to try to pretend there's one social license the project has it or, or doesn't have it. And so that's what uh, this uh, application of social network analysis uh, achieves. It gets away from that idea that, you know, uh, we decide who has a, uh, what pro whether a project has a social license or not by shouting at each other. Um, you can just admit that there are differences of opinion. Um, so on, in this type of a social network graph, uh, the uh, higher, the vertically higher the, the, the circle is, and the circles represent stakeholder organizations, the more influence it has. That's uh, determined by network analysis uh, uh, calculations called centrality. This is, in this case, it's eigenvector centrality. It's uh, once you've got uh, the network in, in this form, you know who's connected to whom. Now you can just calculate who, who has that higher level of centrality. It's a number that comes out, and they are more, uh, other studies have shown that they're more influential in that network. The colors here represent the level of social license that was granted, with red being uh, withheld and dark green being the the full trust. Uh, this is the way it looked at uh, Minera San Cristobal in Bolivia in 2009. Um, 
I've standardized this data across the years. Uh, but the important thing here is that um, the uh, nearby villages with jobs at the mine, there was a fair bit of support. There were a few. It was mixed. It was mixed. There were still some groups that, uh, that didn't uh, grant a social license. This guy was the head of the... Uh, youth sports organization and he wanted lighting on the soccer field. What do you call it? Soccer pitch or whatever. <laughs> pitch? <laughs> whatever. And, um, and so he wasn't going to grant a social license. But there were uh, leaders of, there were three villages that were the closest uh, and they, um, the general, the, the people with more influence were more uh, positive. Uh, this group was the municipality and villages that were further away. They were only at the acceptance level. They didn't approve, uh, but they were at the acceptance level. So, And then uh, this group was at the acceptance level, and some of them were withdrawing the social license. Uh, but they're not shown here because of the standardization. But they, uh, they, they were a relatively cohesive group of uh, campesino organizations, farm agricultural organizations, most of them over 50 kilometers away from the mine. So you'd think that, you know, they're not getting any road traffic, not getting any dust. They're, why are they the ones who are most opposed to the mine? And it turned out that what was going on was that the, the villages close to the mine had negotiated a, a deal where they would get right of first refusal on jobs at the mine that they were qualified for. So they were getting the jobs and they were getting the incomes. A family with, I mean, several families would have three people working at the mine and they would, the household would be bringing in over 10,000 US dollars a month out in southwest Bolivia, where you <laughs> don't need nearly that much money to live. So there, it, what it did is create social inequality that never existed before. So that in, in effect, uh, by making these villages wealthy, they made their neighbors poor. Even though the incomes of their neighbors were going up in absolute terms, the relative poverty increased, and that is not acceptable anywhere. I mean, there's objections to that everywhere, but in this culture, it's really not acceptable. Uh, they are uh, living off the land. Uh, everyone has to contribute equally and gets uh, rewarded equally, right? They go out and they harvest uh, wool off the, the wild bikuna. Everyone has to participate. If you don't participate, you get made um, leader if you think you're lazy, they make you the leader for a year, and they give you jobs to do. And if you don't do that, they ex uh, uh, ostracize you, and you can go live in the desert by yourself. Uh, the other villages won't take you in because you've been ostracized. So basically, they, you're dead. Uh, so they really <laughs> emphasize, <laughs> couldn't emphasize equality more strongly. And this group. Uh, was also part of the political machine for Evo Morales, uh, who, you know, uh, becoming the first indigenous president in, in Latin America, promised to nationalize uh, all the resource companies because they belong to the people. So we thought this was a bit of a, a risk, a social political risk to the continued operation of the mine and uh, what to do about it. Um, okay, so these, these guys are saying, you know, either shut down the mine or close that inequality gap, share the wealth, create uh, regional uh, prosperity. And I thought, okay, that sounds like a better option. We'll see if we can do that. And uh, the, the company did start uh, a, uh, a regional, uh, economic Development Forum, trying to multi-stakeholder forum, trying to bring together the municipality, the departmental government, which is like the, the state, uh, the national government, uh, 
and uh, and all the the companies in the area are all cooperatives. So all the cooperatives as well. Uh, to talk about how they could get uh, economic development going, identify the barriers that they had. Water is the big one because it's a, de a very arid, arid area. Uh, so they started talking about water projects. The, what are the, the, the municipality actually had millions of dollars that it was receiving in, in royalties, but the mayor was afraid to spend it because he would go to jail if he did it the wrong way and broke one of the many, many rules about spending money. So, it was just piling up, and eventually they started working on ways to uh, uh, overcome this, to set up a foundation, an economic development foundation. Anyway, long story short, um, this is the 2013 graph. These are the nearby villages. A little more positive, more green at this time. Um, Although this guy is still withholding the social license to get lighting on the soccer pitch. Um, this uh, is the municipality. They've become much more positive. Uh, he, got, he got a consultant <laughs> to come in and help him figure out his way through the, the morass of regulations about spending money so they actually could start doing projects in, in the municipality, which is a huge, huge region where the mine is located. Um, and the, the villages further away are, are mixed, again, but more positive than, than before. Uh, we didn't look at these in 2009, but they turned out to be the new danger point, which is the national government and, and, and state government, people who, uh, who still want to nationalize the mine, especially foreign companies. I mean, you know, it's bad enough to have private companies, but foreigners. Um, it's a Japanese company. So that uh, was good to expand the definition of who's a stakeholder. So now uh, we can see what where uh, the full range of social political risks. And this group is the are the. Uh, the Campesino organizations now they're all supportive uh, and have become much more dominant, much more influential in the region, which I was pleased to see. Um, they, uh, they're the original uh, uh, people uh, with the original uh, lifestyle there, formed into cooperatives. One of the big things that happened was because of the access of water and uh, the, the social capital that they gained through this process of uh, trying to promote uh, economic development is that they uh, were able to take advantage of the rise in prices of quinoa, which increased six times. So now they're, they're actually not against the free market anyway. They're not calling for nationalization anymore. They can actually see how free markets might actually work for us too. So um, that was uh, actually there. Everyone's pretty happy there now. Um, there, you know, in the in the process, there was some corruption that had to be dealt with, and it was dealt with. So uh, things uh, turned out okay. Uh, so far, <laughs> but there's always something new. But anyway, the the main point is that you by by doing a so combining social network uh, uh, analyses with the measures of the social license and the knowledge of what their issues are and concerns are of the of the stakeholders, uh, you can come up with strategies that uh, will promote. Uh, uh, economic development will reduce poverty and it was a very poor place uh, at the same time that it reduces social political risk usually you have to do both at the same time you can't really do one without the other uh, so there was social change there in this region uh, but also an ongoing uh, tension between uh, the partnership you know the uh, psychological identification and and meritocracy because the um, the corporation uh, is a completely foreign way of organizing uh, in that area, in uh, that part of Bolivia, uh, as it is in much of the world. Uh, it's something that was developed in 1602 in Amsterdam. 
<laughs> and is, has grown from there. But most of the world is, doesn't organize itself like a corporation does. Uh, they, they developed that partnership, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, when they were doing the, the resettlement. But that's also when they made that special deal that the, the local people would get a right of first refusal on um, jobs. Uh, San Cristobal residents, and that created complaints from outsiders. There were even cases of you know women who would come and marry guys from San Cristobal so that they could be considered residents and get jobs at the mine and stuff. All sorts of crazy stuff would happen because of this, and a lot of resentment from villages you know only 30, 40 kilometers away that that weren't uh, um, first in line for the jobs. And uh, also they wanted to, there was in, in 2011 protests to take control of the Human Resources Department uh, because they didn't like the focus on the meritocracy. It was too focused on qualifications. They wanted to get promotions and, in, and the Human Resources Department was insisting on educational qualifications and experience and they didn't think that was fair. Uh, so they, they occupied the mine. Um, and the medical unit too, they had problems with that. Those who were paying more for uh, medical insurance were getting a higher level of uh, attention and that was unfair as well. That's the concept of justice, different in different cultures. And um, so there's this bit of a tension between you know, partnership and, you know, uh, you scratch our back, we scratch yours versus meritocracy where, no, you don't get that promotion because you don't have the qualifications. So now that is starting to be resolved with uh, more educational opportunities, especially post-secondary and, uh, and technical and joint proposals to acquire a, a government regional hospital. But that's the way the, the, um, the issue shifted. Um, to deal with this, what is essentially a cultural conflict about what is fair? What are principles of meritocracy versus principles of, uh, of uh, partnership and looking after your own? So there was a tremendous social change. Um, and I think that that's why the social contract factor uh, became pretty prominent in this case and, and in many cases. Uh, this is on the, on the left there is the traditional style of housing. That's what San Cristobal was like uh, in 1994. There are still villages like that. Mostly only the old people live there. The young people have all moved away. Uh, and this is uh, what it's like today. That's a new house in town. And they've done that like in 20 years, and it's an incredible uh, transformation for them. And of course, they're earning so much money, they're buying real estates in neighboring, real estate in neighboring towns and so forth. Uh, a financial advisor has set up office in the town. Uh, they have parking problems because when they were doing the village relocation, they didn't dream that they would all own big trucks, and now they do. <laughs> So uh, it's just been a mind-blowing transformation for this, uh, for this set of villages. Um, but the, the corporate culture is different from the traditional culture there because it, it, it bears a certain principles from the European Enlightenment, that of the meritocracy over in-group favoritism. So, I mean, we call it nepotism in the West, but that's... It's just called looking after your own people everywhere else. It's normal. Uh, and the uh, equality of opportunity is something from the West. All, all men are created equal before God, da, 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 da. But um, people are rewarded on uh, their performance differentially. They're not equal in their re rewards. Whereas in the traditional... Uh, Quechua village here, uh, everybody gets the same outcome. And then they do question why the CEO gets paid more. Um, so it's sort of like a social contract that had to be negotiated on a, on a microcosmic scale 
to, to merge these two, to, for these two different cultures to be able to work together and, and get things done together. Uh, and that was the hardest part probably of getting a social license there was working out their arrangements with each other. Uh, the uh, social license is, is similar because it's about acceptance or the acquiescence by society regarding new arrangements, and therefore it's like a mini social contract. Uh, it's like a social contract that, that has to be negotiated in the sense that it has to be negotiated because there's no, nobody to impose order on, on this society and tell them how it's going to be. Uh, in this case, they had to create their own order uh, through uh, negotiations. So, you know, Thomas Hobbes talked about the Leviathan imposing order in order to avoid chaos. This is a negotiated order, and so that's definitely social license stuff, or social um, contract. And, um, you know, uh, there was no, they couldn't even rely on a, on a common uh, a set, of a, a set of social order coming from a common culture or a common view of, of what is uh, the greatest good for the greatest number because the cultures were so different. Um, so uh, a micro-social contract was negotiated in the, uh, uh, it appears, it was negotiated in the Alta Plano Sur in that part of Bolivia, in which blended the, the Quechua traditional way of life with this very strange thing that arrived, the Western corporate way of doing things. Um, so, okay, uh, if it was like a social contract, then who actually negotiates the social contract? So this is where I started looking back in history to s at the history of this idea and, and what, what, uh, where it came from. Uh, the most famous, probably, statement of it was Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, and he said it was a contract between the state and the citizens. And in effect, in the uh, 18th century, it was a contract amongst the state, the church, and the citizens. There were just three big powers that were setting up the rules uh, in society. The citizens were the newcomers. Uh, it can be viewed as a negotiated distribution of the rights and responsibilities of each of these big sectoral powers in society at the, at the, at the national level. Uh, and uh, that, that continues to evolve uh, because the who is in power continues to evolve. Uh, in the 19th century, there was more private wealth around and they became one of the big powers that uh, negotiated things and, and uh, inserted their rights and responsibilities. Early 20th century, it became more the state, the corporation, and, and labor. Labor unions rose to ascendancy at that point. Robert Reich has written a good book about that phase of capitalism in which uh, there was the, this triumvirate negotiating the social contract. Uh, late 20th century, the labor unions declined in power, but civil society grew in power. Uh, and uh, from in the 10 years from 1994 to 2004, uh, the the nonprofit sector, the civic the civil society, uh, uh, grew at twice the rate of the rest of the economy. And uh, so it uh, really came in, uh, became ascendant then. Now we're in the early 20th century. I think we talk about the social license more because the civil society is, has continued to rise in importance. Um, so there's been historical changes in the, in the way that the so social contract is negotiated. And the, the uh, social license concept recognizes that uh, in that there's now the civic sector is now sits at the bargaining table. Nonprofit revenues in the U.S. in one year, 2004, were 1.36 trillion. See, this, that's a, a big number. That was the revenues. This would be the million. This would be one million. Whoops. Yeah, I better, oh. There. One million there. At that digit, <laughs> that would be one billion. That's 1.3 trillion dollars, an amazing part of the economy. And that's just in one year. Um, 
so they uh, they have power and therefore they, they are starting to participate in the negotiating social contracts very evident at project levels um, and I think that's that's why we are hearing the term the social license more often because it, it deals with that kind of thing so in the West there's been a recurring pattern to the negotiations there's always there's been cycles of expansion of the franchise or inclusiveness or empowerment and uh, we're in another one of those right now I believe um, at the same time authority has become more diffuse Rousseau said the king does not receive his power from God but from the general will of the people uh, but if, every, if the social license means that everyone gets a veto, uh, then who's the king? Um, is everyone the king? Uh, or is, uh, if every, it just raises questions about where we are in the change process and, and how the negotiation of the social contract is, is being carried out now. Um, if everyone can, who organizes a protest can, has a veto, then who's the modern equivalent of the king? Um, and who expresses the general will of the people? That was Rousseau saying that the, this is the ultimate legitimacy. So we might be able to think about this, you know, history repeats itself, that old saying. I was thinking of uh, what's going on now and how to compare it to what happened during the Enlightenment when the social contract idea first appeared and was first developed. Um, this is the, the uh, Cox snowflake, which is a fractal, uh, and it's a mathematical set of, uh, it's a branch of mathematics that deals with uh, recurring patterns. And they, re in this case, they recur on, on smaller and smaller scales. Uh, the first, what, the, the thing that is happening in this repetition of change with this fractal is that the triangle is, has an inverted triangle superimposed upon it. So when that happens, you get this figure to the right here. But then that creates a new triangle here, and a new triangle here, and a new triangle here. And the process is repeated. All the triangles get a, uh, another triangle of equal size superimposed upon them. So that continues. And then that creates <laughs> another triangle and another one. And then you know you've got a lot of them. And the iteration goes one more time. All the triangles get uh, another inverted one imposed on them until with multiple iterations of this thing, what started out as a, a triangle ends up as a, as a snowflake. But I think the important thing is that this is a repetition of a, a, a pattern of change um, on smaller scales in more places. So I think that might be an analogy for what we're seeing because we see conflicts going on all over the world now and the social license being used to describe them. And, and so it's like the social contract is now being negotiated at the grassroots level in many, many different places at once through this recursive process. So what happened the first time it was negotiated? Um, the first step was in the Enlightenment was that the, uh, we'll just look at this uh, center column here first and go down there and then see if there's any analogies to what's going on now. Uh, there was, the, that was the age of reason when uh, the theology of the Catholic Church was questioned. And uh, this was carried out by uh, philosophers, highly educated people of the time. Uh, then uh, reason got absorbed into authorities. The, the princes uh, started to support these people and uh, the Protestant Reformation happened. It was a breakup of, uh, it was an absorption of these ideas that challenged the authority of the church. Um, and there was at the same time uh, a rise in literacy and commerce and colonization. And all of these are quite rational processes. Um, uh, the, uh, 
the profession of accounting, for example, had a huge growth spurt uh, at this period, and that, uh, and we still use things that were developed at that uh, period today. It still uh, affects a lot of our thinking in, in economics as well. And then there was an expansion of the franchise again. The idea that uh, that everyone uh, is equal before God became the idea that everyone should be equal politically as well. And um, but this expanded the movement to people who weren't the privileged, highly educated class of uh, scientists and philosophers. And so it became the Romantic movement. And that was characterized by nature worship. Uh, Percy Shelley called uh, poets the natural legislators of society. There was the emergence of the cafes and the Grub Street hacks were the first uh, uh, journalists who were attacking not just the aristocracy, but also the, uh, the scientists and those who were the highly educated class and who had been absorbed into the power structure. And then, you know, in France, it, it became the reign of terror and uh, chaos uh, resulted in Napoleon coming in after that. In British, in, in England, it took a different uh, 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 trajectory and um, that was the height of the British Empire and they went all, all out on their uh, colonialism and imperialism. Okay, so that's... <laughs> now, if you know anything about history, you're probably going to laugh at this, right? But anyway, it's the, the general stages. Uh, what is going on today? Um, you know, uh, back with uh, Silent Spring, Rachel Carson's first book, there was this challenge uh, to the, the politics of progress. Uh, the Club of Rome uh, saying that there's limits to growth. We cannot just keep growing indefinitely. Um, and that was also the same era of the, the civil rights movement, which became human rights. Uh, that was uh, challenges to the uh, accepted way of doing things at the time. Then we went into a stage where uh, all this rational critique uh, was absorbed into the authority structures. Businesses become green, uh, adopting CSR, sustainability, diversity policies. What's the next step? Um, the romantic turn on, on these changes we're going through now where uh, nature worship has got an equivalent in, in the concept of Gaia today in the environmental movement. Uh, the Grub Street hacks are equivalent to, uh, or comparable to the tweets and Twitters and uh, social media that you see uh, these days. Um, politics has become less about trying to uh, use science uh, and more about identity, um, and, and in that sense, more about uh, equality and enfranchisement. And then we got concepts like active resistance and direct action, the urgency for change as there was during uh, the reign of terror. Just keep chopping off heads until there's bread in the bakeries. <laughs> no bread, keep chopping off heads. We got a, a, the idea that uh, uh, we need social change immediately. Um, so Maybe you agree with those uh, parallels and maybe you don't, but uh, we've uh, seen um, we've seen the pattern in the history. Uh, it seems to repeat itself. Uh, if this is true, then we can talk about the social license actually having two different meanings corresponding to the two different phases of, of the Enlightenment, the, the Age of Reason and the, and the Romantic Era. Um, uh, I think they're probably both both have some validity and uh, validity and both uh, with us today. The romantic view of the social license says that the king is the corporation and it doesn't receive its license from government, but rather from the will of those who can organize a uh, protest movement. And they are those they are opinion leaders. And 
and this is um, this has uh, support in public opinion polls. Globescan uh, does a regular public opinion poll. This is a uh, from a 20 nation public opinion poll that says that uh, NGOs and activists are the most trusted groups in society. Up there, with si they're even more trusted than scientists, but scientists are up there too. So those are the two scientists were and uh, the romantics were the two leading groups in uh, the um, enlightenment. And today they are the most trusted. The lowest in trust are uh, tobacco companies, chemical companies, mining companies, and energy companies. The king, <laughs> right? The authorities. So uh, the idea that, uh, you know, as Percy Shelley said, the, uh, they are, the romantics are the unacknowledged legislators of society has some validity. Uh, uh, there's management theory about uh, how social change happens in terms of the life cycle of social issues. And it, uh, eh, many, many studies show a repeated pattern in which first there is organization by uh, grassroots uh, people who are basically activists. They create awareness of the issue. It becomes uh, a movement and disseminated more broadly to the point where politicians then have to start paying attention. And the politicians will typically study it and then they'll change regulations or, or, or regulate. So who starts it? The, the, these people who, uh, who would uh, take this romantic view of the social license, and these are, the, are the, the most trusted people in society. Really, if you look at the life cycle of social issues and take it on an issue basis rather than think of governance in terms of <coughs> formal elections, then they, they really are the ones who get, get the ball rolling. The rational view of the social license uh, takes more of a utilitarian uh, approach and says we can use uh, this, uh, the social license at a project level as a social laboratory for experiments in extending participatory decision making to the globally marginalized and excluded in both the West and non-Western cultures. So it is trying to keep it in a box. <laughs> but also trying to keep it rational, keep it understandable, and, and get a, a social contract that everyone can accept. So the questions raised, uh, is, the, uh, is, is, is social license seeking a competitive advantage for Western corporations, uh, having inherited this tradition of the Enlightenment? Uh, well, realistically, you're going to have to do, they need it anyway, uh, whether <laughs> it's a competitive advantage or not, because the legal license isn't enough. But a strong social license might be a competitive advantage, uh, maybe for countries and maybe for whole industries too. Uh, the Canadian Department of External Affairs and Foreign Trade is, is certainly thinks so. They go around telling people that uh, Canadian companies are, uh, more likely to give you a good social contract. Basically, that's their message. They're trying to brand uh, Canadian companies that way. Whether or not it really is a competitive advantage, but they think it is. Um, and uh, especially might be a competitive advantage against state enterprises, for example, in Africa. I know the mining industry. There's a lot of uh, Chinese mining companies in Africa now competing with Western mining companies, the Ben Australian. Uh, in a South African whose uh, methods at maintaining the, slow, the social license are, are there. The Chinese use a more top-down approach. They'll cut a deal with the president and then uh, uh, the, the local leaders, and it's less open to modifications in the decision process. Whether that will turn out to be an advantage for them in, in the longer run remains to be seen, but it's, it's a question that is raised by this. And what are the alternative approaches used by non-Western corporations? Are there really any different? Uh, we don't know. We need to do more research on that uh, in, 
and if they're different, uh, how are they different, and why are they different, and uh, which approaches work best in which situations. So, final, finally, <laughs> it looks like we might actually believe in something after all. The social license discourse is rooted in Western culture, and, and, and all of these things like CSR and corporate citizenship, um, free prior and informed consent, are part of the ongoing negotiation of a social contract. Uh, and that requirement to negotiate a social contract comes from the Enlightenment. Um, and we manifest our commitment to the Western Enlightenment and those values when we advocate human rights and CSR, uh, free prior and informed consent, and when we practice meritocracy and impartiality and decisions based on public and transparent evidence. Those things are uniquely Western. Thank you. <laughs>